The Gilded Ones, Chapter 4 In the end, Elder Durkis doesn't even argue with white hands about my fate. All it takes is a pointed arch of her eyebrow, and I'm unchained and dressed with such extraordinary speed, it's as if the hounds of the Afterlands themselves have risen to nip at the Elder's heels. The Elders may hate to lose the wealth I've brought them, but they dare not go against an emissary of the Emperor. It's night outside when they lead me to the steps of the temple, and so the dark moon only barely sparkles on the snow-covered ground. A blast of icy cold wind hits my face, sending tears to my eyes. It wouldn't sting so much if I had a mask to cover my face, but I'm an impure woman. I'll never be able to wear a mask now. The thought should fill me with despair, but gratitude sings through me. I've been freed from the cellar. I've never thought I would be. I never thought that I would feel the wind again. Never thought I'd glimpse at the sky again. This almost feels like a dream. The blissful ones I have whenever I die and my skin takes on the same golden sheen as my Take these, Elder Durkis snarls, shoving something coarse and heavy into my hands. They're an offering for the emissary's mounts. I look down, surprised to find a burlap sack filled with plump red winter apples. A sob chokes me. Winter apples are harvested only at the height of a cold season. If these are as fresh as they seem, I've been locked in the cellar for two full months, perhaps longer. More sobs come, each one more racking than the last. Elder Durka's lips curls into a sneer at the sound. Wait here, he growls. Walking towards White Hand's wagon, a small, rickety wooden affair with tiny windows on each side and a single door on the back. The two large creatures are attached to it. They look almost like horses, but there's something funny about them. As I blink, trying to make them out through my tears, Elder Durkis calls to White Hands. I've brought the demon as you commanded. Demon. I should be used to the word, but the shame curves my shoulders and I huddle in my coat. That is, until White Hands guides the wagon nearer, and I see the creatures clearly for the first time. They have human chests sprouting from their horse-like lower bodies and talons where the hooves should be. The breath rushes out of me. Those creatures aren't horses at all. They're echoes, horse lords. Mother used to tell me about them, how they ran through the desert on their talons, herding horses and camels. Similar creatures roam the more remote mountains of the north, but they are larger and much more heavily furred. Strangely, these echoes are wearing heavy coats over their glossy white bodies, and they even have furred boots over their talons. It's much too cold in the north for these kind. The larger one sees me staring and nudges the other as they near the steps where I remain, huddled into myself. Look, look, my Sama. A little human to eat, he says. He has a stripe of black hair in his otherwise pristine white mane, and his nose is so flat it's almost a muzzle. The smaller one is pure white from head to tail, and his eyes are a large, gentle brown. Looks tasty, Brahma. Shall we share her between us, he says with a smile. I shrink back, alarmed, but White Hand turns to me with an amused smile. Don't worry, Alaki. Brahma and Masama are vegetarians. They only eat grass. And apples, she adds, pointedly. I blink, then hurriedly remove the two apples from my sack. Oh, here, these are for you, I say. Walking over, I slowly offer them up, mindful of how much longer these aku loom over me. Greedy, long-fingered hands snatch the apple out of mine. Mmm, winter apples, Brahma, the black striped echoes acclaims, crunching into his. Suddenly, he doesn't seem dangerous at all, more like an overgrown puppy playing at being fierce. He's obviously the elder of the twins. I realize that's what they are now, because the other than his larger size and the black stripe in his hair, he and his brother are identical both beautiful in that ethereal, otherworldly way despite their powerful physiques. White Hand shakes her head fondly. You should be nicer, Brahma, she chides. Decca is our traveling companion. As I frowned at this strange depiction of a circumstance, she turns to the elders. What are you waiting for then? Hurry it up. The elders quickly do as they're told. Warm clothes and a few packs of food are bundled into White Hand's wagons, as are several flasks of water. The entire process takes only a few minutes. 
Then White Hands helps me into the back of the wagon and shuts the door. To my surprise, someone else is sitting in the furs back there. A girl my age, with a plump figure and blue eyes and blonde hair, so typical of the northern provinces. She smiles at me cheerfully, her face half covered by an ocean of furs, and a tingle rushes over my skin, one distinctly different from what I felt when I sensed the death shrieks. This tingle feels like recognition. Could she be one of my kind, and a locky too? Hello, the girl says, and gives a pleasant little wave. She reminds me of Elfried the way she seems so shy and eager at the same time. Only the accent is different. Hers flowing in the rhythmic up and down of the remotest northern villages, the one so high in the mountain that it takes weeks to reach them. I am taken aback to find someone else sitting here. I barely notice the clinking until I glance up to see Elder Durkis approaching the front of the wagon, a pair of manacles in each hand. White Hands is already seated at the reins and she watches impassively as he nods at me, disgusted. That one is unnatural even for an alaki, he sneers. Refuses to die no matter how many times you kill her. Best to keep her chained away from the other one before her bad blood spreads its influence. I flinch at his words, shame growing, but white hands and presence freezes colder than the wind now whipping through the air. I neither fear the little girls nor need shackles to compel them, she says, ice dripping from her words. Now if you will excuse me, she clicks the wagon's reins. Just like that, I'm riding out of the only home I've ever known. Elder Durkis watches me, a chilling hatred in his eyes, who will bleed for gold now that I'm gone. As we pass the last houses in Erfoot's outskirts, White Hands gestures towards the girl. Decca, this is your traveling companion, Britta. She's going to the capital as well. Hello, Britta says again. Surprisingly, she doesn't seem scared of me at all even after what Elder Dirk has said. But then, she's an alaki like me. I manage a small, shy nod. Evening's greeting, I mumble. Britta will explain to you more about your kind, White Hand says. She should know, she's the same as you. Well, almost. I cautiously examine Britta from the corner of my eye. She catches my look and grins again. Other than my parents and Elfried, no one's ever smiled at me so much. I fight the urge to duck my head in embarrassment. So you're new to this Zalaki business too, she whispers conspiratorially. I just heard the word for the first time today, I reply, glancing down. Britta nods eagerly. I didn't know myself until I started bleeding the cursed gold during my senses. My dad nearly killed over when my mom showed him mine. But they did me right, she called herself. She nods at white hands. She came and took me two weeks ago. Apparently I'm one of the lucky ones. When I glance up at her, confused, she explains, a form most girls get executed in the temples the moment they're discovered, and their families were punished so they never speak of it. Now everybody gets sent to the capital. They've even started taking the younger girls, the ones who haven't been proven by the ritual of purity. The moment they suspect that, you cut, and that's it. Despised are the marked or scarred, the wounded and the bleeding girls. The quote from the Infinite Wisdoms rushes through my mind. I nearly laugh at the irony, the wickedness of it all. Now I understand that they don't want girls to get cut or wounded before the ritual of purity. It's so the impure ones like me don't discover what they are and don't ask any questions before it's too late. It's likely the only reason they don't kill the impure girls before the ritual. Kill a girl any other time and their family will protest, but the rest of the villages will ask questions, voice their objections. It's the ritual that gives legitimacy to the murder. An impure girl is despised by Oyomo, her very existence an offense to him. Her murder is sanctioned by the infinite wisdoms, and who can argue with the holy books? Who would even try? All the families can see from then on is the demon that somehow infiltrated their bloodlines. The sheer wickedness of its stings. Britta looks up at me, pity rising in her eyes. Must have been horrible what the bastards did to you back there. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. More memories, all so sudden and powerful, my body trembles from the force of them. The cellar, the gold, blood rushes to my head and light becomes print picks. I close my eyes against it, faint. You all right? Britta asks, concerned. I slowly nod. I am, I say. Then I clear my throat, try to change the subject. So what did White Hands tell you about our kind? Britta's eyebrows raised. White Hands? That's herself's name? 
Her surprise is so unexpected, so genuine. I smile and I shake my head. I don't know what her real name is. I gave it to her because of the gauntlets. Britta nods, quickly understanding. It's a bad lust to ask the Emperor's emissary directly for their names. Never invite trouble into your house, as the saying goes. I prompt her again. So what am I? What are we? White hands never explained fully. Demons, Britta says. The word a shard of ice through my heart. Well, they're descendants, leastways. She leans closer, eyes wide as she whispers. She says we're the descendants of the Gilded Ones. The Gilded Ones, I repeat, alarm rushing over me. I know the Gilded Ones. Everyone in Oterra does. Four ancient demons. They preyed on humanity for centuries, destroying kingdom after kingdom until everyone finally banded together for protection, forming Oterra, the One Kingdom. It took several battles before the first emperor was finally able to destroy them, and he did so only using the might of Oterra's combined armies. Every winter, villages enact plays chronicling the Gilded One's defeat. Elderly aunts wear masks carved in their images to frighten naughty children, and men burn straw figures in their likeness to scare off evil. And I'm being compared to them, being called one of them, heart drumming a sudden and panic beat I rummage in my pack and unearth the golden seal white hands gave me, quickly counting the stars embedded in the Ancestor. When I see what's there, tears sear my eyes. Four. Four stars in the symbol. Four gilded ones. Why didn't I suspect this? I should have known. Should have at least suspected the moment my blood ran gold. The gilded ones were female after all and they were always depicted with gold veins running over their bodies. No wonder Oyomo took so long to hear me. No wonder I had to submit to the executions, the bleedings, for so long. I am an insult to the natural order itself. Britta doesn't seem to notice my despair as she smiles at me. Oh, you got one of these too? She says excitingly, holding a gold seal identical to mine. White hands gave it to me when my ma handed me over. Most saddened they were to see me go, but it was... You were telling me about the Gilded Ones, I quickly reminded her, trying to stop her from saying anything more about her parents about her life before now. She's not even horrified, not even the slightest bit disgusted by what she is. But how could she be when her parents protected her, kept her from harm, from dismemberment, while mine, tears prick at my eyes when I remember father's word, it would have been better if you had just died. Did he even cry when he heard of my death? Or was he just relieved? Grateful to be free of his unnatural burden? Does he even think of me anymore? I dig my nails into my palms to stop the thoughts from circling and try to focus on Britta as she answers my question. Oh yes, gilded ones, she says brightly. By the time Emperor Amika destroyed them, they had already intermixed with all sorts of children and humans. We're the result. They're again children, thousands of times removed, I suppose. So we are demons, I conclude, a dull, heavy feeling settling over me. Half, Britta corrects, less than a quarter, probably. Whitehand says we change only when we're near maturity, which is 16 for our kind. Once we begin our menses, our blood gradually turns gold, and that makes our muscles and bones stronger. That's why we heal so fast and are quicker and stronger than the regular folk. It's because we're predatory beasts now. Like wolves and such. Predatory beasts. Bitterness jolts at these words. I remember the surge of strength I s I remember the surge of strength I experienced when the death streaks came. Remember how I could see in the dark cellar even when there weren't any torches. Now I understand why. It's because I'm no better than an animal. A fiend skulking at the edges of humanity. Perhaps that's why even I could sense the death streaks. Why mother could even sense them as well. But that doesn't make sense. Mother wasn't Elaki. If she was, she would have bled the cursed gold when the red pox turned her insides to sludge. And then she would have fallen into the gilded sleep, her body taking on a golden hue and repairing itself while she slept. Then she would have came back. She would have come back. By the time myself came, I could almost lift a cow, Britta grins. Very helpful when you're milking and they begin to get all unruly. I heard you're a farm girl too. I nod slowly, but my mind is far away. 
I have a lot to think about. A lot to grieve. Bruh. I love Britta. I, it, it, it really makes me feel like there's different ways and different perspectives on how you can deal with trauma. And Britta looks at this like an opportunity. Or she could just be, uh, what's the word, naive. You know, she does seem a little, like, positive. You know what I'm saying? And it does seem like Decca is more of a pessimist. So this might be a good little friendship that she needs, man. Um, but I, I'm digging this so far. Um, I remember I told you guys this was going to be the last chapter. But um, given it's a new year, I decided against it. I'm going to keep going, whether you guys are listening or not. I'm really enjoying this story, and I'm just going to keep doing what I do. I'll just sprinkle in more stuff as we go. But that being said, I appreciate you for tuning in. Happy New Year, everybody. And uh, tune in next week for Chapter 5 of The Gilded Ones. Yeah.